You will never find anyone who, who champions Kansas harder or louder or more proudly than Ron Estes. It's great to be back here. Um, you know, there's always a good lineup of speakers, and I just assumed I was the, uh, the supporting actor when I saw Susan was uh, on, the, on the program today. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, uh, I may get the, uh, to have my name on the door and, and get the, uh, you know, the accolades of being in office, but uh, without the support of Susan and the family, I, I, can't, I can't get the job done. And uh, so I appreciate you and, and uh, what you do for us. And, or, um, it it's, uh, makes it easier for me to zing back and forth uh, in D.C. And, and in the district here. Also, John mentioned several of the staff uh, members from the office, and it, it's great to have them them here as well because uh, you know the the primary role of the office in the district is making sure we focus on constituent services. So if there's issues that come up, I uh, always try to remind folks uh, that. You know, call our office, uh, whether it's something dealing with uh, dealing with Social Security, dealing with the VA, dealing with immigration or passport issues. Uh, all of those things are, are something that we can help with. It's, it's kind of sad, but, uh, you know, it, it really does work sometimes that when uh, a congressional office calls that some of the bureaucracy uh, does start to get the things done that, that should be been done. You know, we've got several pictures that are scrolling up here. Just uh, some of the things that we've done over the last... Uh, a year and a half, or actually a year and a quarter, I guess, really, uh, since we've been in office. Uh, one of the things that we've uh, been promoting is the uh, the Where's Ron hashtag to just just promote some of the places we've gone. Of course, my opponent from last year wanted to co-op that hashtag and and, uh, uh, and and talk about where where I haven't been, but I think it's just because he can't keep up with all the places that we're going to. <laughs> so. I want to do a couple quick uh, uh, things, just several topics I want to go over, and then uh, ideally have some time for questions at the end. Just from a, a legislative update, trying to uh, do maybe an overview of things that have happened over the last uh, uh, year and a quarter. You know, we we focused on a lot of things, and and number one is just the uh, the economy and how do we keep moving forward with uh, economic growth. And I'll I'll talk some more details about that later. Uh, but working on promoting free and fair trade, open markets, working on, on uh, supporting our veterans and military, making sure that we uh, protect Social Security and Medicare so that it's available for those folks nearing retirement and, and that are retirement, working to defend the Second Amendment and working to, to defend life uh, as we can. And so, uh, you know, I'm proud of a lot of the results that we've got uh, that accomplished over the last uh, year and a half. And um, so just talking a little bit, one of the major accomplishments uh, in 2017 through the legislative process was passing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And that combined with the regulatory reform that President Trump's promoted either through executive orders that we've passed through Congress through the Congressional Review Act, or in some cases passed uh, brand new legislation uh, which actually tried to roll back some of the, the burdensome regulation that was out there. Uh, last quarter, second quarter of 2018, uh, the economy grew at 4.1 percent, which for the previous 10 or so years, uh, it had averaged 1.9 percent, which is a huge uptick in terms of uh, the opportunities that we have, the amount of, of income that folks have that they can take home uh, to use for their family, for their issues, to go buy a new car, go out to dinner, uh, to take the family out for a movie, uh, just that opportunity that po people have. Uh, and at the end of the day, it also raises more tax revenue uh, just from that economic growth. So we've seen, uh, we've seen from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, I mean, we look at where the United States was before it was passed and after it was passed. We had the highest corporate tax rate in a developed world. In fact, we were fourth highest, period. Um, behind, I think it was Somalia and, and Nigeria and, and uh, one of the countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, but what that was doing was that was disincentivizing companies to do business in the United States. 
we were actually telling employers that they should, they'd be better off uh, opening a plant in Europe or in Asia or South America instead of employed Americans to make products that we could export. And uh, what we'd seen over the years was an erosion of our tax base, an erosion of, of the middle class quality jobs in the United States. And so lowering that tax rate to be competitive, lowering it to 25% of the corporate rate uh, uh, is a huge boost for, for the economy. Lowering um, pass-through income for uh, subchapter S is down to 21%. Uh, uh, First time ever that had been adjusted. You know, up until that time, it was all based on, on the tax of the individual. So basically the highest individual rate, which at that point in time was 39.6%, plus all the surcharges for Obamacare that were on top of that. Um, but what that, what that was doing was it was a disincentive for people to take the risk, to start the, the new, uh, maybe build a new plant, maybe hire new employees, maybe buy a new piece of equipment, uh, maybe promote uh, to, to be involved in a new product line. And so as a result, that was where we were ended up with that slower economic growth. And so it's really uh, unleashed the capability of, of the American economy to grow. We've got a long way to go uh, to dig out. We've got uh, a lot of problems that have been built up over the years uh, that uh, we still have a, a ways to go. One of those benefits out of that were all of these companies that had additional savings from their tax cuts or additional savings because utility rates were lowered because the utility taxes were lowered. Uh, but all these companies across the country uh, were uh, either giving salary increases or bonuses. There are over a million companies across the country that had announced uh, bonuses or pay raises. And you know, just locally, uh, several of the companies that did, Spirit, Cox Communications, Wichita Railways, Textron, um, and most recently, Legacy Bank as well, uh, joined that list of folks that have actually put out uh, either pay increases or, or benefits or, or bonuses for their employees. So that's more money in South Central Kansas, in our economy, uh, helping with our growth and, and a positive thing. <clears throat> so should we quit there? No. Uh, it was 31 years. Uh, before we got tax reform done uh, since, thank you, yeah. since the uh, uh, 1986 tax reform. So we're going to try a different approach going forward. We're going to look at, uh, on an annual basis or every couple of years, a process of what we need to do to help keep the tax code current with what's going on in the economy. So when we uh, get back in session in September, we're, we're going to roll out what's called what we're calling Tax 2.0. And basically looking at some of the things that we weren't able to accomplish with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act last year, uh, including making the individual rates permanent. Uh, because of the rules of the Senate when we passed the bill last year, uh, had to make the individual rates uh, not permanent. And because they couldn't go through the whole 10-year cycle that the way the Senate calculated uh, the rules. So we want to make those permanent. Uh, it's pretty much a similar process that was done with the Bush tax cuts back in the early 2000s. They initially came in as uh, temporary uh, cuts and then, were, and then were made permanent as well. So we want, to, we want to make those rates permanent. There are several extenders, tax extenders, that have been um, passed on every year, added to the mix. Uh, we want to look at making those permanent that make sense uh, because what we've seen is that if you wait till, till November, December to make an extender permanent, even though you make it retroactive back to January, the businesses and individuals haven't had time to go out and utilize that tax rate. So maybe they would have made some additional investments. Maybe they would have uh, put the effort into hiring additional people or, or started a new program. And uh, without that, they haven't been able to do that. So we want to we want to make some of those things more permanent, so people have more more stability to build upon. I want to talk a little bit about trade as well. You know, we all know for years that uh, countries like China have cheated, uh, the stealing intellectual property, uh, not following trade agreements that were out there. We also know that trade agreements over the years 
the United States, as the wealthier country over the last several decades, have tended to want to get a deal. The president in office at the time wanted to have something that they could hang their banner on. Uh, so, so many of the trade agreements uh, came out over the years that were advantaged against the United States. Uh, whether it was, you know, we, we could apply a, a tariff of 2% to automobiles that were imported, but uh, a country that uh, imported automobiles from the United States could apply a tariff of over 20%. Um, and those types of things have happened gradually over the years. And what we've seen is that it's cramped cramp trade. Um, the president's taken the right approach in terms of we need to, we need to balance this out now. Um, as the European Union has grown as a, as a big block, as China has become such a large uh, uh, part of the world economy. The, the, the avenue to do that has been to put tariffs on because other countries don't want to give up the benefit they have. I mean, China's playing hardball. They know they've got it to their advantage. Uh, they're tr they're um, wanting to do as much punitive as uh, they can to help keep that advantage that they have. So, you know, the president supplied tariffs. Tariffs aren't the solution. That's not where we want to go. I mean, it's a tax. You don't want to add a tax onto the process. It, it disrupts free and fair flow of trade. It's not an open market. So we want to make sure that we get from that point to get to where we have uh, trade deals that are uh, fair, that provide open markets, help us make the economy grow throughout the world, because um, we're, we're all better off if we have trade. I mean, there's so many things that uh, we have a competitive advantage at that other countries have a competitive advantage on some other things. Uh, and we just want to make sure that uh, we continue that, that open market and that free flow of goods. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic. If I look at, uh, at the schedule right now um, in, in terms of things that might happen, looks like uh, sometime, ideally early this fall, that uh, we'll, we'll close the agreements with Mexico as part of the NAFTA agreement. I think it's gonna take a little bit longer with Canada. Uh, there's a couple of things that were particularly advantaged for Canada in the uh, NAFTA agreements, uh, particularly dealing with dairy products uh, and dealing with uh, Canadian law on intellectual property. Uh, so those are some things that are probably a longer term process to work through, uh, but we can get moving forward with uh, Mexico. Uh, Mexico's been a, a great trading partner particularly from an agriculture standpoint with the United States. Been a lot of goods that have traveled through uh, on the Kansas, uh, Kansas City Southern Railroad uh, through to and from Mexico. But we need to make sure that uh, that's not abused. One of the final points we're working on now is, is uh, basically dealing with automotive uh, manufacturing in Mexico. Uh, there have been some instances where uh, European or Asian car companies would open a plant in Mexico but they'd really take the components from their home country and basically tighten a couple of bolts and then, then it became a quote unquote NAFTA qualified product uh, to come into the country. So uh, that's part of what the administration's working on. So we wanna make sure that we get back to open markets. Um, the, the trade aid that was introduced, uh, uh, I guess three weeks ago now, by the administration to help support the farming community, the agriculture community, dealing with China, uh, that's not the solution. That's not what farmers want. That's not going to solve the problem. Uh, what it is, is it's a signal to China that the administration's serious, the administration's got the, the backs of uh, the farmers and uh, individuals across the country, and that the sooner China comes to the table to renegotiate, the better off we are. I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> veterans in the military. You know, we've all heard the horror stories over the last uh, eight, ten years about the VA, some of the mistreatment of, uh, of individuals across the country. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a poor state of affairs that that had happened. We put a lot of effort into this year passing several bills to help address that, help provide the Secretary of, of the Veterans Administration the ability to actually um, manage their employees and make sure that if there's issues with an employee, uh, that they could actually, uh, somebody wasn't doing their job, that they could move them out and, and get somebody in that would do the job. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've had, we've not had as many issues with the, uh, with the Dole uh, Hospital here, 
uh, but there's some things that could be improved there. You know, I, I know from a personal standpoint that um, my father was denied multiple times uh, being admitted into the VA into Topeka. Um, luckily for him, he'd worked for Goodyear and had a retirement uh, health insurance program, so it wasn't an issue for him, but just wondering how that issue would have impacted uh, him and, and how it impacted others as well uh, through, that, through that process. We passed the VA Missions Act this year, uh, which is basically takes VA Choice, which had started several years ago, and expands that so that there's a lot more opportunities for veterans to get the care that they want and need. And basically what it does is provides them more opportunities to choose between whether to go to the, the VA hospital or to go <coughs> to the doctor in their, in their home community to, to receive the care they need. One of the things that has been a problem over the years is that, you know, if you, you live in Garden City or you live in, in Hayes, uh, having to come drive into Wichita uh, to just have weekly test or monthly test um, was one of those things that you could do in a doctor's office in your home community. And that does a couple things. One, it makes life easier for the veteran, uh, but it also helps the, the medical facilities in those, in those rural areas uh, you know, have more health care as well instead of having it all concentrated in the larger cities. The uh, other thing that we've passed this year is the National Defense Authorization Act. And after several years of decline of the military, uh, we're actually boosting the military back up. You know, in 2017, there were 23 fatalities of our servicemen and women uh, due to hostility actions. There were 80 deaths due to training or maintenance or other mishaps. And that's primarily because when you cut budgets, the easiest things to cut are training and buying spare parts. And so what we've seen is a hollowing out of our military and our military capability over the years. And what we've done now with the, the National Defense Authorization Act is uh, fully fund what the president requested, what General Mattis wanted to get the military back to the bases. To be able to start, and, and I'll talk a little bit about this later, but to be able to start buying those spare parts. Because part of the problem we'd run into in spare parts was if you weren't doing the appropriations process on a timely basis, you couldn't buy spare parts that may have taken a six months or nine month lead time to go through the manufacturing process. And so as a result, uh, with the, the way we had been doing appropriations, uh, they weren't able to order and buy those spare parts to maintain them. So uh, that's one of the things that we wanted to, to fix in that process. Make sure that we, we fund programs like the KC-46 tanker that's coming here to McConnell. Make sure we fund programs like the, the uh, F-35 and the, the uh, CH-53K, which, you know, uh, programs like that, planes, planes, helicopters, uh, are a vital part of our military mission, but they're also a huge part of South Central Kansas economy and supportive of, of the economy that we have here. I want to talk a little bit about uh, some longer term problems as well. Uh, you know, we all know that uh, Social Security and Medicare have been long term programs uh, that have been uh, supported, provided a backstop for individuals over the years. Uh, we're starting to get to the point where they're reaching the end of their viability at the rate we're going. And my push is to make sure that we don't have to cut benefits, that we can preserve and protect them, make sure that uh, as we go through that process, we don't get to a point 10 years from now, 15 years from now, where benefits will have to be cut because we're running out of money. And I'll just give us a couple examples. Um, Medicare runs out of funds in the trust fund in 2026. So in eight years, Medicare won't have any money um, and, and won't have enough money to pay, to pay the bills. Uh, that's from the hospital insurance program. The combined Social Security uh, and Disability Fund runs out in 2034. Both of those have been creeping up each year and 
for those of you like me that have enough gray hair that can remember back in the 80s, there were some fixes put in to Social Security Administration so that it would have a lifestyle, a life span of uh, 50 to 75 years. And uh, that's the kind of process that we need to come back to, to look at, to fix, uh, to make sure that uh, we're not at the point where we have to look at cutting benefits. Because if we don't do something by 2034, then we will only collect 70 cents on the dollar for the benefits that are promised for all the retirees in Social Security. So if we can start on it now, uh, it'll be less painful to fix, and it's gonna become a big, bigger burden uh, as the budget deficit continues to grow. And, and uh, so I wanna to work to fight through that. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I did as state treasurer was to fought for capers in terms of making sure that we reform that and uh, made sure that uh, it got back to where it's, uh, it's moved a lot on the funding status uh, since the reforms that we put in place. We wanna do the same thing for Social Security. So I mentioned appropriations a minute ago. Um, only the federal government can figure out a way to mess up a budgeting process. That's pretty straightforward. I mean, most of us realize what, what you have to do in your business or what you have to do in your family in terms of managing a budget. Well, at the federal level, it takes us three steps to actually do what most people can do in one. So we do an authorization act, which basically authorizes a program, authorizes some, uh, some general spending, and then we set that aside, and then we go do a budget. So we have a separate committee that actually creates a budget, uh, creates a 10-year budget uh, that uh, defines that budget by uh, that process, in each of those different categories. And then we set that aside. And then we go do appropriations. And appropriations where we really decide what we're gonna spend next year uh, on each of the areas. Uh, usually, we do stay under the budget uh, levels because that's, that's kind of a, a set in stone uh, direction that we wanna go under. But until you finish the appropriations, you don't have money to spend on the programs that you've authorized and quote unquote budgeted for. So the way the federal government's is, uh, the money's appropriated for the federal government is that we have 12 different categories of appropriations bills. One of them covers defense. One of them covers the VA and military construction. One of them covers health and human services. One of them covers energy and water. One of them covers agriculture programs. And so in theory, we should be doing 12 different appropriations bills pass them through the House, pass them through the Senate, and the, and the President signs each one into law. Well, it's been 1996 since all 12 of those appropriations bills have passed both houses of Congress. Instead, what we typically do is we get till September 30th, and then we've run out of time, and so we pass either a continuing resolution, which basically says, we're gonna spend at the same rate at the same program for the next two months, three months, six months. And then at that point in time, we have to come back again and figure out what we wanna do. And at some point in time during the year, we will pass what's called a, an omnibus bill, which is basically a huge spending bill where everything's all thrown into one big pot. It's a bill that has to pass, so all sorts of junk gets added into it that can't stand on its own, that people wouldn't vote for in, in, in the light of day. So uh, it gets passed as part of this, this omnibus bill. So we've put a big push on, uh, actually started before I came into, into the House, but uh, we've been putting a big push on to, let's get back to regular order. Let's get back to what we all learned in civics class of the House introduces a bill, we debate it, we put amendments on it, we pass it, sends it to the Senate. And, and do that with appropriations. Do that for each of the 12 appropriations bills and, and get those through the process. So I, I mentioned since 1996, it's been 1996 since all 12 passed, uh, passed both houses of Congress. There has been one that passed in, in, uh, since 2011 and that was during the Zika virus times and the Health and Human Services budget passed. Uh, but that's the only time that it passed and was signed into law uh, since then. So, Last year, the House passed all 12 of the appropriations bills, uh, but the Senate didn't take up and pass any of them. 
Um, this year, we are going to pass some. It may be only five or six of them that get passed through the House and the Senate. So we've kind of taken a different approach on the House side this year is uh, uh, working with the Senate to try to craft uh, some of those bills that uh, can work through and, and be uh, passed through the Senate. The Senate actually, because they're behind, are still in Washington uh, this week. And uh, they have passed now seven of the appropriations bills. So uh, we need to reconcile those with the versions that uh, the House has passed. But uh, I'm expecting that four or five or six might get uh, completed this year and passed into law. Um, I don't know that we'll get everything passed just because probably the thing that I've learned the most in the last year and a half is that if we don't have to make a decision, we'll put it off. I mean, if we'll put it off till next week, we'll put it off till next month, till next year. And so uh, hopefully we'll get, we'll get through that process. The big value out of passing all 12 of those is that they're smaller bills, they're more manageable, they have a specific content that you're looking for, and so you don't get a lot of crap thrown into them as part of that process. And so that's a big push that we want to put on uh, now and moving forward as well, just to make sure that uh, we're doing appropriate work with, with the taxpayer dollars. Um, just talking a little bit about some of the legislative accomplishments over the last uh, year and a half. Uh, you wouldn't know it necessarily by uh, listening to the media, but uh, there's been a lot of things that have, that have worked through, uh, particularly worked through the House. Uh, we've passed over uh, 760 bills out of the House. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. <laughs> um, the, uh, unfortunately, there's over 560 of those that the Senate hasn't passed yet. And you might think, okay, so that's just the polit politics back and forth. Well, of those 560 that the Senate hasn't passed, over three, roughly 300 of them uh, passed by unanimous voice vote in the House. So it's not like there's a lot of partisan activity that's keeping uh, those from moving forward. It's just the dynamics in the Senate that slowed down their whole process. Hence, that's why they're still working uh, this week, working on confirmations and, and uh, working on some other legislation. But just some of the things that we have accomplished over the last year and, and talking in highlights, I mean, the, the opioid epidemic across the country has been a major impact on a lot of people, a lot of individuals, a lot of families. Uh, we passed funding for that as part of our, our appropriations process. Uh, you know, here in Kansas, we don't have we have an issue, but it's not as severe as in some other states. Uh, we, but we still do have an issue with meth. We still do have an issue with fentanyl as well. And so uh, we wanted to make sure that when that bill passed that it also provided funding to address some of those issues. Um, we passed a Right to Try Act, which basically said that if a patient has been diagnosed as having terminal disease and that there's no expectation that current approved medicine will, will save their life, that they have the right to try experimental medication, that they have a right to, to participate in uh, drug trials or a specific medication that's not been fully proved yet uh, because that's a choice that they may want to make uh, as an opportunity for them, uh, which, is, which is great from a standpoint of individuals having the opportunity to do and, and to choose what they wanted to do. Um, we focused a lot on the, on the IRS and some of the outdated rules and regulations that have come out of the IRS, focusing on making sure that um, some of the uh, inappropriate behavior and misuse of IRS data, IRS activities uh, was addressed. You know, at, at the end of the day, you can put laws in place, but you also have to make sure that you have the right people and, and the people have an expectation that they, uh, they should be following the law and the rules around them. One of the other things that, to some degrees, a little bit of a success, but a little bit of frustration on my part is, uh, you know, the Dodd-Frank law that was passed in 2009 has put a big cramp on the growth of our economy. Uh, and what it did was uh, created a huge new bureaucracy, tied the hands of banks and credit unions, 
uh, tied to hands of lenders um, in terms of all, a lot of, in some cases, silly regulation. So we, we passed a regulatory reform in the, in the House, uh, which basically was a repeal of Dodd-Frank and, and uh, making sure that we had some common sense regulation moving forward. Of course, it's not going anywhere in the Senate. Uh, Elizabeth Warren, Senator from Massachusetts, was it, that was her baby, uh, was the Dodd-Frank uh, law. And, and so uh, we know that's not going back uh, to pass in, in complete. So what we've done is gone back on the House side and focused on, let's pull out some components of that, pass some of them as standalone pieces. And in the meantime, because they're, they make more sense, uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, Democrat support on passing some of those components. So, you know, instead of passing a bill with all Republican votes for with, you know, 225 votes or so, uh, pulling in Democrats on particular issues has, you know, got passed components with 270, 280 votes, uh, which has made it more likely to get things through the Senate. What the Senate's done is taking part of those and, and crafted a Senate bill 2155, which is, addresses a lot of issues on the financial side, but uh, not enough. And, and so uh, that's passed through the House, passed through, or passed through the Senate, passed through the House. And so we are getting some, some benefit out of that, uh, but uh, there's so much more we could do. The other thing that I'm particularly proud of that, that we pushed through is uh, now made it a federal crime for websites to be used for promoting prostitution and, and human trafficking. Uh, we actually, within 24 hours of passing a bill and the president signing it, uh, Backpage, which is one of those websites that were actually actively promoting human trafficking, uh, primarily for sex, uh, that was shut down. And so, you know, it's basically one of those things that, you know, when you're in a situation where you have the opportunity to make things better for people's lives, uh, that it's great to be able to do that and be able to participate in that. I'm going to talk a little bit about politics and then maybe open up for some questions. Of course, we've got the uh, midterm elections uh, coming up this fall. Um, I no longer have to run against myself now, so that's over with. Uh, uh, so, um, you know, the, the media has been talking a lot about a blue wave and, and um, uh, okay, so, uh, uh, I was going to use the term fake news, but that's kind of, uh, we'll, we'll see in November. I, here's what I think is going to happen. I mean, I think on the Senate side, we'll pick up uh, two to four seats on the Senate. Uh, depends on how the how election goes. Um, you know, right now we have 51 uh, Republicans and, and 49 Democrats. Uh, well, actually, 47 Democrats plus two socialists um, that, uh, you know, that, that campaign with the Democrats. Um, the, uh, uh, so I think we'll pick up two to four seats there. Uh, the, uh, the House has mostly been one that's talked about as, as the Democrats taking control of that. The, the aspect, when you look at it, it's, it's really a race district by district across the country. And uh, there are specific issues in each district that are, that are relevant. Uh, one of the things that cuts across that that's positive everywhere is just the economic growth, how good things are going, looking at the accomplishments that we've uh, made over the past year and a half, and, and keeping pushing through that process. You know, here uh, I'm running against the same guy I ran against uh, last year, and, um, and since then he's, he's gotten more radical. He's turned hard to the left in terms of talking about the issues. Uh, wanting big government health insurance, wanting uh, uh, more of the socialist policies, you know, brought in Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez to, to help pump up the, the, um, the socialist message, uh, which, which isn't good for Kansas. It isn't good for the country. And uh, what we're seeing now is uh, even the Democrats are having to fight back against the most extreme Democrat socialists within their party. And... Um, uh, the DNC or the DCCC runs uh, uh, campaign ads against in primaries against some Democrats because they don't want the hard the hard left folks uh, because they know that's not what America wants. But we're going to continue that effort. We're going to uh, you know political pundits like Cook and and others 
uh, rate this as a safe district, but we're not going to take it for granted. We're going to keep working hard and, and continue that process because, you know, somebody asked me once what keeps me up at night, and, and I guess standing here today thinking about it, it would be Nancy Pelosi as speaker and Maxine, yeah, Maxine Waters is uh, the chairwoman of the Financial Services Committee. The, you know, she's the woman that told all the people that go attack Republican office holders, and um, that's just not that's just not the way of life that we want. Because, you know, when you look back, the if the Democrats take control, they'll have the first three votes they'll have will be result in Nancy Pelosi becoming speaker, um, will result in raising taxes and will result in impeachment process against the president. So basically, everything that'll happen over the next two years will be hearings and conduct against the president's administration and all the positive things that have, that have started uh, would be stopped. Uh, just talking in general about Kansas, uh, we, of course we have, um, you know, first district's a, a relatively good district, should have, uh, you know, Roger Marshall should be able to, to uh, get reelection to that. Uh, Kevin Yoder in, in uh, Kansas City area in the third district uh, is going to have a tougher race. You know, the uh, uh, Bernie Sanders came and campaigned for one of the Democrats. The Democrat Congressional Committee campaigned for another one, and and uh, uh, she's actually going to be Kevin's opponent in uh, in this election. Uh, that we may not realize it because it doesn't really stand out much, but Hillary Clinton won that district. Uh, by uh, roughly one, one percentage point in the election last year. So uh, Kevin's got his work cut out for him. He's a good campaigner. I, I believe he'll win um, but, and continue to work through that process. The second district where Lynn Jenkins is stepping down is going to be uh, a, a much more interesting race to look at. Uh, Paul Davis, the Democrat has, uh, who ran for governor, uh, won that district in, uh, in the governor's race. Uh, but uh, he's just been collecting money. Uh, the Democrats didn't have anybody else running against him. Had a political newcomer to get elected there. Um, used, used, uh, it was a seven-way race. Um, there's uh, uh, family money that, uh, that Steve Watkins uh, had to help him in his election, which uh, you know, helped him get through that, that primary. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I've talked with Steve a couple of times, but uh, you know, as he goes through the campaign and, and positions himself uh, as a candidate for, for the general election, how that process works. Um, but I think at the end of the day, um, having the, that nightmare of Nancy Pelosi is probably going to help a lot of voters in the second district uh, uh, vote for Steve as well and not vote for Paul Davis. We've uh, just had our governor's race. It was kind of interesting. Everybody in the country was watching Kansas uh, in that close race. Um, which is, which is, it's good that it's over with now. Uh, I mean, uh, I know with having a, a multi-candidate race, uh, there's a lot of folks that uh, uh, their candidate didn't win in that process. Um, but now that we have our nominee, it's time to, to work towards November. Uh, we've got, we don't have a state, or we don't have a U.S. Senator on the ballot this year, but we have Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and uh, Attorney General, Secretary of State, uh, insurance commissioner and state treasurer all on the ballot as well as all the state reps and so it's a good opportunity for us us as Republicans to to get together and, and work uh, and do another clean sweep through that process this year so that's what I'm looking forward to I know uh, everybody in this room's uh, engaged actively engaged if not in particular campaigns uh, engaged in in just What's the right message? What's the right thing we should be doing for the country? And uh, I, for one, appreciate you for what you're doing, uh, whether you're helping with my campaign, whether you're helping somebody else. It's a, it's a great um, thing that we as, as Americans can have the opportunity and stay involved to, to maintain the, the uh, democratic republic that we have. You know, Ronald Reagan probably said to quote the best that, uh, you know, democracy is not a birthright, that it's only one generation away from extinction. And we have to be ever vigilant on that. So thank you for all you do in that regard. So. All right, thank all right. you very much. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to questions. Uh, Sounds as uh, most of you know who are here, we always start with Packer and Club members first. 
and uh, if there happens to be any time left over afterwards, then we'll, we'll reach out to others. So you can ask me the easy questions. Susan will get the hard ones. <laughs> hey, Susan, uh, no, um, always a joy to have you here. I know one of the things you worked on in the tax issue was the ability of American firms to repatriate some of the money that they kept overseas. I wondered if that was happening, if you didn't have time to take a look at that. And, you know, that, that that's a great lead-in, and I, I probably should have said something about that. You know, the last time it was calculated at the end of 2015, there was over $2.6 trillion in corporate profits that had been on, on, earned overseas um, that typically what happens is a, a division or, or something of a company uh, operating in a different country, they pay taxes in that country where they operate and uh, then most countries allow you to bring that country back, to your, that money back to your home country. Uh, the United States tax code prohibited that. Well, it didn't prohibit it, it just said, you can bring it back, but we're gonna tax you again at our high tax rate. And so what we did as part of the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was, was to end that process, have, have a, a small payment for the money that's currently out there, but allow companies to bring money back and allow them to use it to invest in plants or, or pay raises or uh, dividends, uh, any of that's positive. The, uh, typically, what's been going on the last multiple quarters over, over several years was roughly 40 to $50 billion a year or excuse me, roughly 40 or $50 billion a quarter was being repatriated back just because of cash flow needs for a corporation or that. In the first quarter of 2018, there were $300 billion brought back into the U.S. economy, which again, that's the money that's gonna be here for new plants, new uh, bonuses, uh, all of that's going to be good economic growth for the United States. So we're starting to see that. We haven't seen the second quarter numbers yet, but that was a huge, a huge uptick uh, on, a, on a quarterly basis. Congressman, uh, yes. would you uh, kind of describe what the procedure would be and how a president could actually be, um, what do you call it, <laughs> taken out of office, impeached? What has to happen to do that? So the process for that is the uh, uh, there have to be some some charges brought forth to the uh, uh, judicial committee on the House and 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 work through uh, that in the committee and then the committee would have to bring their findings forward to the floor of the House and the actual the term impeachment is the actual vote in the House that uh, to I guess. In, in legal sense would be to file charges against the president and then it goes to the Senate to actually uh, convict him if you will so we're trying to relate that back to uh, our judicial system the way we think about it but uh, that would start out first in the house in the Judiciary Committee so both of them have to be approved by both Senate and it has to be passed by the house the, the actual impeachment occurs in the house and the conviction occurs in the Senate um, in, in that process so that again that's one of those things where the Democrats take control of the, the uh, House, that's some, one of the things they'd start up. And, you know, it, it's kind of sad because some of the messaging out there is that uh, some of these Democrats come off as if they hate President Trump more than they love America in terms of the way they're attacking him. Yes, Steve. All right. Um, well, then I'll ask the question that I have just because it's something that we hear about an awful lot, and that is our national debt. And it seems like we continue year after year not to address that and kick that bucket down the road. Is that even something that realistically we can address or ever work on? Yeah, that, that's a um, trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar question. Um, you know, during the the Bush administration, the debt doubled from roughly five trillion to ten trillion. During the Obama administration, the debt doubled again from ten trillion to just under twenty trillion. Uh, now it stands at at uh, just over twenty one trillion dollars. One of the things that's one we need to do some major things. Uh, working with uh, uh, 
some of our, our major programs, whether they're entitlements or working with some of the programs that are, you know, we're trying to push to, to support. Like, for example, on the farm bill, uh, we put into the farm bill on the house version that if you're drawing food stamps, you should work 20 hours a week or work uh, getting education uh, as a provision for drawn food, uh, food stamps. And it's, it's not that we're mean hearted because Americans want to have that safety net, uh, but we're at the point now where uh, what we're seeing is that a lot of folks are, uh, uh, the disincentive out there to work is there and, and we're, we don't have enough people applying for jobs. We have uh, 6.7 million open jobs and only 6.3 million people looking for work. And so uh, that's, a, that's a step of it. The other thing, I was, I was one of the first House members to call for a reinstatement of uh, the rescission process. So for, for decades, presidents have introduced rescission bills, which basically said, I know we have this much appropriated, but because of the way this program won, because we were more efficient, because uh, uh, something happened in the, in the dynamic, we got the job done, uh, there's extra money left out there. And so uh, rescission bills were used to say, okay, let's give that money back to the Treasury. Let's, let's uh, not do that. So if you look at pres going back to President Carter, Reagan, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, all used rescissions. In fact, dozens of them. The lowest that I saw any president was was over 100 rescissions that they introduced. And the way that process works is the president introduces a rescission bill that says let's cut spending on this particular program and then the, uh, the Congress has to approve it. That was stopped after 9-11 so George uh, W. Bush uh, didn't use rescissions, Barack Obama didn't use rescissions and what we saw as I mentioned earlier is a doubling of the debt during each of those. So these are small things. We, the, we tried to pass a $15 billion rescission uh, earlier this year that the President had introduced. Uh, we couldn't get the Senate to pass it. Passed the House, but not the Senate. But basically, including in that were things like uh, funding for the Children's Health Insurance Program, which had been set aside in a bucket in case it was needed. But we had just recently reauthorized CHIP for 10 years and fully funded it for that. So that money was for the old CHIP program, no longer in place, no longer active, but we couldn't even get enough of a vote to, to not use that anymore. We had funding in there uh, from the Zika virus that we talked about earlier that was set aside in a program for that, uh, just sitting out there and waiting for somebody to figure out a way to go grab it to spend it on something else. And so we've, we've got to beat the drum more on um, how do we get our deficit under control and uh, it's, a, it's a shame to think that we might leave our kids and grandkids worse off uh, because you can borrow money as long as somebody's willing to lend it to you and then when they stop, you really in a hurt world of hurt. Uh, there are a little over 60 million Americans who are uh, in the Medicare system, 65 and older. The current system is pay in when you hit 65 you're then placed in the system but the democrats now have a plan what they call medicare for all which would basically under the current system basically for those seniors will be medicare for none for them going forward and we'll have a single payer socialized system uh, how are you going to communicate this superficially appealing medicare for all for the fact that it's actually going to be devastating for everybody who's 65 and older and dependent upon medicare yeah so basically when, when the, the socialist campaign that they want, quote unquote, Medicare for all, basically what they're advocating is government run health care. And in order to do that, that means government has to take over every health care activity that we have. So if you're a union member and you have a good union insurance program, that goes away. If you're a uh, work for a company that provides you good health insurance, that goes away. Um, you know, President Obama promised that you wouldn't lose your health insurance if Obamacare came along, and uh, we see how hollow that was. Well, this government-run health care really is that taking over all the insurance. 
Some of the negatives around that, in addition to that, is that it won't end them taking out of your paycheck a payment for quote unquote Medicare, but basically it just goes into the pot to fund this government run healthcare. And um, it's, it's really disingenuous and deceptive uh, discussion on their part about what, what it really is. But it, it's basically that government takeover of Medicare, takeover of insurance that, uh, um, you know, we fought for so long to avoid. And uh, uh, so it's going to have to be something that we continue to fight through the campaigns this fall as well as next year when we get back in, in session. All right, Congressman, last question over here. I'm Sulman Sadek. I've been 45 years, one of the heart surgeons in Wichita. And I belong to a Christian family coming from Pakistan. And my question is regarding immigration. We have our Christian family, but 300 non-Christian. And I have seen an immigration out of 1,000 families, refugees. There were only 50 Christian families. And I had written to Mike Pompeo the latter and got a very good answer from him. But I also want to ask what we are doing in that area. And also, I strongly support what we are doing in Turkey for that pastor, Christian pastor, who is in prison for two years. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so, let me talk about. Uh, Turkey first, just briefly, and then, <clears throat> you know, uh, Pastor Pastor Brunson there. Uh, I mean, it, it's really coming to light now what what's uh, what's going on there. Turk, what I understand is that President Trump was under the expectation that he had agreement uh, with uh, with Erdogan uh, from Turkey that if uh, we helped get a cleric out of Israel, that um, that Pastor Brunson would be released, and uh, that didn't happen. I mean, the the only thing that happened was that he was allowed to go into quote unquote house arrest, um, and and so what we've seen, particularly the last two weeks, is now there's an economic toll being uh, hitting Turkey. I mean, uh, from a standpoint of uh, the issues dealing with their currency, and and uh, so. I, we're going to have to keep the pressure up on Turkey from that standpoint to, to get uh, Erdogan into uh, uh, cooperating as a part of the civilized society to, to move forward with that. But uh, I think there's the effort is on the administration and part of the country to help continue that effort. The just like in so many other countries, whether it's the Coptic Christians in Egypt or or uh, the, some of the Syrian refugees in Lebanon or, or, or Jordan. So we've, we've got a lot of issues there. One of the things you raised on immigration, I mean, just to say a general story about uh, immigration is there's so many things broken in our immigration system. I mean, it's one of those things that as we've seen a problem, instead of solving it, it's just been put off and kicked down the road. And, and so as a result, we've got things stacked on top of each other dealing with whether it's, whether it's how you apply, going through the legal process, how do you become, go through and get one of the visas for work visas. Uh, all of the issues with refugees, as you mentioned, is, is another issue that we're just starting. I, until the last, uh, I don't know, what was it, three or four weeks ago that we had some folks in our office talking about um, the whole refugee process. I'd, up till that time, I'd been primarily focused on the work visa issues, the, the border security issues, how do we make sure we address uh, uh, some of the things for folks that are in the country and, and trying to go through the legal process. Um, but there's some some things, and I don't really know that I have the answer yet in terms of answering all of those questions, but uh, there's a, a stream of refugees coming into the country um, that I'm not sure there's enough process being done to address why they're coming, how we track them, what are they here for, why are they here, and, and how do we fit them into the immigration process, or should we be feeding them into the immigration process? I know the, the Obama administration wanted to do um, you know, place a lot of Syrian refugees here, which um, that's not what 
that's not been past practice. Um, you know, in terms of if there was a war zone around the world, the refugees would, granted, would put a burden on the countries around that, but when the war was settled down, they'd go back to their home. And uh, that's the process that we need to continue to follow and, and go back to. Um, and I don't know, um, I don't know the specifics on, on Pakistani refugees around that, as, as you mentioned, but uh, we need to make sure that we, we work on the immigration process. Um, I voted on a bill earlier this summer to pass that, to, to work on from a, from a comprehensive standpoint. Unfortunately, we didn't get enough votes uh, for that bill. Uh, we need to continue working on that. And uh, if, there's some, if there's some other information, let's, let's get that, if you don't mind getting that to our office so that we can work on as well from the refugee standpoint. Um, well, thank you. Ron thank you for what he does for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm, going to ask you, I'm going to ask Ron another question. What about Trump's $25 billion for the wall? So he waits and asks the hard question at the end. Well, you um, said that and went to Susan. Yeah, yeah the hard question. <laughs> Susan, you want to answer that now? We don't have money. Yeah. The, the, um, the, the bill that the, the president had four pillars around immigration, and uh, one of them was dealing with border security. And the, the aspect of border security is partly a wall in places where it makes sense. I mean, there's places in Southern California where there's houses on either side of the border that uh, a wall or a fence makes the most sense. We're not going to build a wall from Pacific Ocean to the Gulf of Mexico because the train doesn't require it, doesn't fit well. Uh, but it's been a sticking point on the Democrats in terms of standing up uh, from that standpoint. We need to do more on border security, which includes a wall. It includes more border patrol agent. It includes surveillance capabilities, infrared as well as uh, camera on drones and other devices. It includes tunnel detection equipment. I mean, one of the things we're seeing is a tunnel being dug from a basement in Mexico into a basement in Southern California, mostly used for drugs but just smuggling nonetheless. And we don't have control of our borders when we're doing that, so. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.